Okay, um, I think we shall begin. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you um, for joining us today. I'm Nora Jacobson Ben Hamed, Assistant Professor of Islamic Thought in the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures, and Chair of the Forrester Lectures Committee. We are pleased, along with the Graduate Council and Graduate Division, to present Dr. Shudipta Kaviraj, this year's esteemed speaker in the Forrester Lecture Series. We have the following co-sponsors for this lecture, including the Program in Critical Theory, the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, the Institute for South Asia Studies, and the Center for Interdisciplinary Critical Inquiry. Many thanks to these departments and programs for their help with this lecture. As a condition of this bequest, we're obligated to tell you how the endowment supporting the Forrester Lectures on the Immortality of the Soul came to UC Berkeley. It's a story that exemplifies the many ways this campus is linked to the history of California and the Bay Area. In 1928, Miss Edith Zweyerbrook established the Forrester Lectureship to honor the memory of Agnes A. Forrester and Constantine E. A. Forrester. Edith was a public school teacher in San Francisco for many years, and the teaching profession was to her an opportunity to develop a true knowledge and love of spiritual values of life in, this, in the young minds entrusted to her care. Edith's beloved sister, Agnes A. Forrester, shared her high ideals and hopes, as did Agnes's husband, Constantine E. A. Forrester. A lawyer by profession, Forrester was a man of high intellectual achievements and of rare personal charm. Although he passed away at the age of 37, he had achieved an enviable place at the San Francisco Bar and was considered one of its most highly respected members. For several years prior to his death, Forrester was the law partner of Alexander F. Morrison, one of the most prominent of San Francisco attorneys, for whom our Morrison Memorial Library is named. In her last days, Ms. Edith Zweybrook expressed her deep and abiding interest in the spiritual life by creating this lecture series on the subject, the immortality of the soul, or other spir similar spiritual subjects. She believed that through the medium of a great university and the words of scholarly lecturers, she might bring new light upon a subject that has interested the world for centuries. Thank you, Edith Swaybrook. And now about our lecturer. Shudipta Kaviraj is professor of Indian politics and intellectual history at the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University, New York. A member of the Subaltern Studies Collective, his research spans Indian political thought, Western political theory, modern Indian literature, and Indian philosophical aesthetics. His works have studied three major aspects of modern Indian history, historical sociology of state formation in India in the colonial and post-colonial periods, modern Indian political theory that has emerged through the anti-colonial movement, and theoretical reflections on history and society in modern Bengali literature. He is also interested in pre-modern systems of philosophical aesthetics and has explored their application to the study of contemporary questions of modernity and its political forms in the global south. His publications include The Unhappy Consciousness, Bankim Chandra Chaturpaday, and The Formation of Indian Nationalist Discourse, published in 1995. He has published three volumes of studies on Indian political thought and practice on the history of state formation, The Trajectories of the Indian State, published 2010, on the History of Indian Democracy, The Enchantment of Democracy and in India, published in 2011, and on Nationalism, The Imaginary Institution of India in 2014. His essays on Bengali literature are collected in the volume, The Invention of Private Life, published 2014. Recently, he co-edited with Veena Das and Brigupati Singh, a special issue of the journal Sophia, titled Thinking from Elsewhere, published in 2024. He is currently pursuing a project on Marx and Western political theory and a study of problems of decolonizing cognitive modes in social science. He also writes in Bengali on themes of political theory and literary aesthetics. In 2022, his work on the reception of Marxist theory in India was published with the title, Marx Sosharagar Shandon, Marx and the Search of, for Paradise. We are very fortunate today to be an audience to Shudipta Kaviraj as he brings together the various interests over the course of his career in a unique and profoundly sophisticated intellectual moment, reaching into the deep archive of pre-modern in Indian philosophy, religious thought, and literature, Dr. Kaviraj brings to the fore powerful insights into the problems of a modern and largely secular world. In so doing, he rejects the prejudice which haunts post-colonial cultures, namely that pre-modern thought is markedly inferior to the modern. 
to look to traditions of Indian aesthetic social philosophy as embodying intrinsic value, the deep consideration of which inspires more sophisticated approaches to the problem of the human condition today, is the start of what Dr. Kaviraj frames as both a deeply personal and collective endeavor of decolonization. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Shadipta Kaviraj to Berkeley. Thank you. The first thing is to make sure that you can all hear me. <laughs> can you? <laughs> OK. <coughs> I thank the organizers, the Department of Religion at Berkeley, for giving me the honor to deliver the Forster Lecture on the Immortality of the Soul, a subject which I don't think actually suits me conventionally. I thank the committee for allowing me, not a scholar of religious thought in any sense, to present arguments in which the Indic religious tradition, however, is a central question. This paper comes out of the last chapter of a book I wrote during COVID in Bangla on Marx and the search for paradise, uh, Marx or Shorget Shondhan. It was an unusually dark time when it seemed we could not see any end to the suffering of the world. Um, therefore, it was a particularly apt time to think of paradise which for me simply means a world without suffering. That book is a long reflection on Indian radical Marxist thought. Its final chapter is called The Search for Paradise, literally, but it makes a proposal for a radical revision of the relation, of our, relation to our past to Indian radical. Briefly, it argued that our conventional orientation towards religious thought, which was totally, exceptionally negative, ought to be rethought. We should retain ourselves to think about the thought of our past. And since much of the past thought is deeply religious, we ought to reconsider our relation to religion generally, for which uh, there already exists a half invitation in the utterly Feuerbachian sentence in early Marx. It is the sigh of the oppressed, and it is the soul of a soulless world. The chapter, which is very long, thinks about several themes of Indian religious thought on the Hindu side, with which alone I'm somewhat familiar. It starts with the Upanishads and goes on to analyze Kashmiri Shaiva aesthetic philosophy and late medieval, or are they really early modern, Vaishnava thinking. That part which I'm presenting to you displaces an earlier address of paradise, Vaikuntha, the ethereal realm where Vishnu, God himself, resides. It replaces it by Vrindavana, the place of Krishna's Leela, Fortunately for us, it did not disappear altogether after Krishna's play with human experience. It exists today as a dirty, chaotic, messy, very human city on the banks of a much reduced Jamuna, accessible by road from Delhi. Let me state my main suggestion simply at the start. There cannot be a human world without paradise. There are, in principle, two images of paradise. The first is an image of paradise that religious thought had sought to develop over thousands of years. Its primary purpose was to seek to cleanse actual human lives, the lives we live as persons, of ethical stains and deformities. The second is a quite different kind of paradise with a different, more public concern at its center. The radical social, that radical social theory sought to fashion from the mid 19th century, first in Europe, but then all over the world in varying ways because this idea proved to be one of the most infectious in human history. This was a search for a society that was cleansed of structural deformities of all kinds, human lives destroyed by systemic disadvantage and poverty. I now feel uncertain as to why the usual relation between these two types of seekers was one of hostility rather than of understanding and friendship. I want to propose that we try to alter that miscomprehension and produce a political alliance of all paradise seekers. Because I think we can invite both sides to recognize their ascent to a minimum basic belief that when we look at the world, we are struck by the thought that human beings deserve a better life than they actually live on Earth. Paradise is that life without its suffering. At that time, it seemed to me 
that religious images of paradise were more unreal than one found in social theory. I said at that time, because this was reflecting about my early days when I was first acquainted with Marxism in social theory, and there was a deep conflict between the two conceptions of paradise, the real and the illusory. One could be established as an idea because paradise is always an idea, only at the cost of the other. One could believe in one only if one did not in the other. Religious people and radicals treated each other with mortal suspicion and ethical mistrust. The religious, the religious thought that those who did not believe in, even in God's existence could not be trusted to hold any moral values. Radicals thought that those who were prepared to believe in an in, entirely manifestly unreal thing could not be trusted to think reliably about anything at all, least of all about the most profound themes of social existence. Now it seems both conceptions are products of the human imagination about the end of suffering in the world. There are two principal reasons for radicals, I think, to explore the resources of religious thought with respect. First, obviously for thousands of years, thinking in human societies about the difference between right and wrong has proceeded through religious reflection. If we say that in approaching our historical tradition, we should not read religious thought at all, but only those who are materialistic doubters of God and religion, some Marxists in India actually tried to do that, we take our own heritage to an unnecessary and unthinkable diminution. The second reason is to gain an understanding of our own intellectual history, our own disfigured, colonially interrupted intellectual genealogy. We still inhabit a social world about which Indic religious doctrines have thought for a very long time. To ignore them seems a strangely inappropriate cognitive strategy. Besides, as radicals, we should take particular interest in the modes of thinking of subaltern groups who have little or no access to English-based modern education. They have to prosecute their tasks of reasoning and judgment, mainly in the vernacular. And that vernacular constantly rustles with the sound of religious language. Religious thought is always directed towards paradise. That is why it's essential for us to grasp what religious thinkers really meant by this concept more closely. Certainly, there are many obstacles in somebody like me thinking about such themes. I'm a religious person. I do not know the languages of religion from the inside. Such languages are usually, usually highly complex and elaborate, developed over long historical spans, and therefore they require long, often specialized training, which I do not have. But this is not a personal failure. For most people of my generation, the self that will be used to access the historical world cognitively is shaped by an education that obviates this world to us and prohibits interest in that direction. So this lack of knowledge is hardly accidental and adventitious absence in a single individual. To access this kind of knowledge inevitably involves us in the hard task of a reconstitution of our cognitive self. Additionally, the religious tradition is vast, if not infinite. In this discussion, I shall take up for some analysis only four moments of our religious history. Actually, I would not cover all the four. Uh, ancient thinking in the Upanishad, just a few sentences on that. Kashmiri Shaivite philosophical theology and aesthetics, uh, from the 8th to the 10th centuries, which gave rise to an extraordinary philosophical aesthetic doctrine, and the 15th century reorientation of religion through the advent of bhakti as the organizing concept, which advised the devotees to forget Vaikuntha and replace it with Vrindavan. Now, an aside, I have always felt a strong urge to set up a relation of affection to pre-modern thought while reading Walter Benjamin among my Marxist reads. Like many others, I have always been a great admirer of his writing, but without asking what made his thought so attractive to us. Benjamin never tries to hide the fact that he came from a Jewish religious background. By, by comparison, there's little stamp of Jewishness directly in Marx's writing. While reading Marx, one does not feel that, one, uh, that no one except a Jewish author could have thought those thoughts and written exactly those sentences. But that is not true of Benjamin. All the pieces that we so deeply admire, I particularly admire, for instance, the taste of his writing, which is linked to the theory that I shall discuss in a moment, are deeply marked with the stamp of their Jewishness. We are charmed by his famed passage on the angel of history, 
This image is not just worth seeing, but also thinking about. First, remarkably, there is no god of history, only an angel. Gods are invisible, immortal, invulnerable to grief. Perhaps more seriously, their greatness is invulnerable to ravages, of, ravages by time. That is why, for history, they cannot be fit signs. The angel is God, immobilized, facing a storm of time. He cannot wave his wings as a relatively lowly inhabitant of heaven. He lacks the strength to withstand the storm. Only fragments of the destroyed human civilization are piling up at its feet. He cannot do anything except watch, frozen in terror. He is not an actor, only a witness. His face is turned, notably, towards the past. His back turned towards the future, an unusual stance for a radical. The storm that is coming from heaven is what we call progress, is what Benjamin says. The first thing to note is that the entire process of thinking advances through images, not arguments, by painting a picture. Benjamin is also desperately seeking to understand history. And this vast canvas is marked by many familiar images. What is striking for a Marxist is, the, is that history is a narrative of loss here. And remarkably, there is no streak of light, even in the distant horizon. But what is most striking is that this language, its sorrowing and grieving words, its manner of depiction, and its rasa taste, is taken out from deep inside the wellsprings of Jewish religious experience. As the Jews had for thousands of years felt the terror of dissolution of the world sheltering them, they developed an extraordinary language to capture this feeling of destruction, desolation, sorrow, and death, this experience which had been there with them forever. No unreligious, tearless language could have found adequate expression for the sorrow of Benjamin's time, I think also for our own time, especially the sorrow of living and dying uh, in that time of disaster. I thought, therefore, that there is no reason for us to feel embarrassed to look into religious thought ourselves. In Bengali culture, Tigor has made this work of words easier for us. He had never engaged in an unseemly quarrel with the languages and the imagic worlds embedded inside the language of Hindu religious traditions, which he rejected theologically. On the contrary, he freely took their words and images, colored them differently from his own palette, and used them with great effect. If he could, I thought, why can't we? I want to concentrate here on the two traditions of thought primarily, internally connected by both borrowing and disavowals that I find particularly attractive, partly because their different conceptions of paradise allows me to demonstrate the major contrast I want primarily to understand. The chapter in my book first explores the Upanishads, the Upanishadic view of wonder, its view that the only appropriate response to our finding a place in this infinite universe is of wonder. But the precise inflection of Upanishadic wonder, which attracted modern thinkers like Tagore, is that it splits wonder into two. A cognitive epistemic wonder at the construction of the universe and an aesthetic wonder that is struck by its beauty. The first curiosity is pursued by science, the second by art. Tagore, therefore, realized correctly that Upanishadic thinking offered a way of avoiding the binary of disenchantment, of believing that the expansion of scientific knowledge made it increasingly hard to see beauty in the world before us. It showed a way of avoiding a Weberian type of thinking about modernity and the inevitable disappearance of religion. I turn next to uh, the aesthetic theories of Kashmiri Shaiva philosophers and then present the way in which Vaishnava Bhakti thinkers use some of those insights to claim that rasa can transform not only our magical and limited time inside art, but human life itself. Shaiva thinkers renewed religious life in many different fields. Their singular notion of pratyabhikya, self-recognition, urged people to engage in ethical self-purification preparatory to recognition of God within the self. Kashmiri theories developed an extraordinary rich heritage of acute reflection in philosophical aesthetics over two centuries. I would turn to this rather than the concept of pratyabhikya itself. The form they gave to this doctrine at the end of the 10th century through the work of many philosophers, but culminating in the work of Avinava Gupta, was never surpassed in Indic aesthetics ever after. Even in the 18th century, we find leading theorists still working through that paradigm. 
Only after the sudden death of Sanskrit knowledge systems as a whole does the theory fade or disappear. But even now, that remains a deep, spontaneous, native language in which performative art speaks to itself in India. Artists still reflect about whether the bhava has been fully conveyed, the rasa fully realized. The language of Western aesthetics has totally colonized analytical, especially academic reasoning. But the terms of aesthetic and artistic practice, if you want to learn singing, if you want to learn dance, artistic practice, refinement, and instruction, pluck it its self words, that is, swashabda, mainly from the old, old rasa theory. I want to take up only a single idea from that corpus, the nature of his aesthetic experience. Experience of drama, here, uh, signified for art in general, is distinct from all other human experience. Strangely, this is not an experience of something real. Yet, this experience wrapped around us externally and fills up from the inside, occupying us so completely that no other experience of reality can, in fact, compete with it. David Shulman has found an elegant name for this, more than real something that exceeds the truth of ordinary reality. There is nothing mysterious or arcane about this characterization. This is simply urging us to think about our common experience of art using tools of philosophical analysis. Suppose I've had a bad day in office, making me cross about myself and the world. In the evening, I go to watch a film or to them to the theater. At first, I shall be aware of the other, other spectators in the auditorium and notice what they're doing. But if the movie is gripping and is really effective art, after some time, only what is going on on the screen will remain real for, real for me and nothing else. My sensory perceptions are of course involved in this, but these theorists will claim that I shall reach a state that is vidyantara sparsha shunya, where I cannot even be touched by any other perception. Theories describe this more than real experience also as the Brahma Swada Sahodara, equal to the brother of the perception or the taste of God. We do not know what the taste of the perception of God is, but can easily understand that they're referring to a condition of pleasure and joy that cannot be exceeded. But, but we should not forget that the taste of this pleasure is not possible in this world, only in the Alaukika, super mundane world of art. These are truths of the world of art, not of the world, in which we reside. For the Vaishnavas, this is an idea of great import and sadness. Let us get inside the darkened theater a little bit more and watch what is going on. It is not that every single spectator is being discreetly involved in the rasa kriya, the rasa process, involving all spectators together. There is a secondary process in which all are getting immersed in the tasting of a singular affect, leading to a singular collective emotion which they call ekaghanatva, that is a unifying experience of all. They are all being cooked in a single sauce, in a sense. In this, the immersion of each helps that of all. Experience of drama is collective or social. Abhinava introduces an extraordinary refinement into the argument here. Collective emotion is hard to conceptualize with clarity. The logical hurdles in its path are well known. Abhinava calls this, the process of sadharani karana, generalization, universalization. My friend uh, Sheldon Pollock uh, slightly uh, feels that this is slightly awkward because of the condensation of already existing meanings. So he uses the term commonization. This refers to a situation where everybody can see a common artistic object, which is perceptible to all, like an actor on the stage. Everybody in the theater can see the actor playing Rama on the stage. This is simple sense of generalization. But Abhinava is seeking a far subtler sense of the concept. Narratives tell us that Rama or Krishna was exceptionally handsome. It is expected that director will find a suitably handsome actor to play him, but that starts creating a philosophical confusion. How would the spectators think of Rama's beauty? If a really handsome actor, I mentioned a Bengali actor, Shomitra Chattopadhyay, but you can think of Tom Cruise, if you like that, is appointed to that role. Physical beauty is entirely specific to individuals. Each beautiful woman is beautiful in her own way. Beauty is therefore an embodied concept. It cannot be abstract. 
I cannot think of a face as beautiful in which I do not see a concrete nose, eyes, lips, etc. The trouble is that though we know that Rama or Krishna were unbelievably beautiful, no one knows how they actually looked. If we do not know the original, how can we imitate it? Rasa theorists will say that imitating Rama is not like imitating an original. The beauty of the handsome actor does not try to copy or remind us of his good looks, because there is nothing to be reminded of. The beauty of the actor invites us to imagine into existence, into arti artistic reality, <coughs> the beauty of Rama, which was the real reality of some kind. So the poet does not merely present the richness of his own imagination before us. He always wants to ignite our own poetic imagination by the light of his own. Thus, the actor's beauty does not claim any connection to Rama's specific beauty. Even if a painter paints an exquisite picture of Rama, the problem is not resolved, because that is the painter's conception of supreme beauty, but it might not be for me or any other uh, observer. Remember, we are not talking about ordinary good looks. Rama, Krishna, etc., avatars of God himself. The form has to be so beautiful that nothing can exceed it, at least to my eye. We can clearly observe that the idea of the most beautiful is coming into a logical clash with the process of making that idea generalized. Each person has a separate and unique, individualized idea of beauty. So how can a single image satisfy all? Avinava maintains that it does not have to. We are pursuing a false lead, thinking like that. Generalization, sadharani karana, does not mean the placing of a single image in everyone's path of vision. It names an entirely different process. It is true that a handsome actor is in the path of vision of every spectator. But his beauty is inviting us to conceive in our own minds an entirely unique individual Krishna of my own. To place it in the path of my internal vision, by my antahkarana, that is, internal causation. So the image that my mind will conjure up will be a creation of my own imagination. These are therefore literally the most beautiful for each one of us. Nothing can exceed it in beauty, because I am myself its creator, because art has employed me to charm my own heart. Thus, Avinava's theory not merely replaces an object of great beauty in front of my senses, but through that, it gives me a report, an address, about where art can be found. And more importantly, introduces me to an unrecognized artist sitting unemployed inside myself. Through art, my relation with the world is transformed, just as my relation with myself. It has seemed to me increasingly that this is the great question of religious life as well. Vaishnava thought transformed the relation between poetry and ordinary people. Poetic capacity exists, not just in the poet, but inside everybody, waiting to be invited out. As Gramsci said, all men are philosophers. The Shaivas are saying, all men are poets. It is wrong to treat poetry as the business of poets alone. Though every person is not a poet, there is poetry inside every, everyone. Usually, we do not perceive it. It sleeps inside us through art by giving them experience of artistic rapture and enticing them by the prospect of more. That latent talent has to be opened up. That is why the refrain, which listeners join in, in Kirtan, is so vital to the Vaishnava Kirtan, like the Kavali. Otherwise, the listeners stay dry on the bank. In Sanskrit, we have a beautiful term, tatastha, that is somebody who stays on the bank, doesn't jump into the water. So, uh, otherwise, the listeners stay dry on the bank of the oral Yamuna. They do not descend into the water of musical bhakti. There are two ways in which humans can transcend the unrelieved wretchedness of ordinary life. They can practice hard moral and philosophical self-cultivation in their lives, but few can reach that goal of reaching perfection and being with God. Uh, Vaishnavas, earlier Vaishnava thinking, uh, Vaishnava thinking has a name for that, which is Vaikuntha. How, how many can attain that level of sophisticated philosophical cultivation? Ordinary mortals can taste a transient paradise when immersed in artistic experience. These thinkers they will not object to Tagore's famous dark description of humanity. The heart of humanity is full of tears, burned by flames of desire, afflicted by the degradation of seeking wealth, seeking wealth dismal and dissatisfied. 
in uh, Bengali it says, Krandana Mayo Nikhilo Hridaya Tapo Dahana Dipta Vishaya Visho Bikara Jirna Khinna Aparitripta. Paradise, ascending heaven is the highest goal of humanity. The Vaishnava version of a similar idea is Vaikuntha, as I said, the realm where Vishnu resides. But in the 16th century, a great change enters Vaishnava thinking on this point. Pandit Jatraj, the singer who passed away a few years back, used to sing a song from a Vaishnava poet, Parmananda Das, which says, Kaha karu Vaikuntha me jaye, Jaha nahi Nanda, Jaha nahi Yashoda, Jaha nahi Gopi Gwala Nagaye, Jaha nahi Jala Jamuna ke Niramala, Jaha nahi Kadamba ke Chaye. So what shall I do going to paradise, going to Vaikuntha? Notice that sentence. I think it's an absolutely explosive sentence, you know, for somebody who is a religious person, particularly a Vaishnava. What shall I do going to paradise where there is no Nanda, that is Krishna's adoptive father, not his real father, or Yashoda, his adoptive mother, where there is no gopi, Krishna's lovers, no cowherds, his friends, cattle, uh, animals who lived with him, where there, is, there isn't Yamuna's purified water, where there is no shade of the Kadamba tree. All defining features of the Vaishnava's desire for paradise can be found <coughs> in this seemingly artless line. This new paradise is also an inhabitant in the nearness of God, but in an entirely different way. The new, paradise, the new Vaishnava philosopher's rejection of the earlier idea is surprisingly sharp. The Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, one of the great theological texts of the new Vaishnavas, states emphatically that if God wants to reward the devotee, the Vaishnava devotee, with states like moksha, is one of the four purusharthas, the great purushartha, true devotees would spurn them. Bhakti makes moksha trifling, moksha laghuta karini. Startlingly, to the four purusharthas that the religious people had followed for millennia, suddenly they defiantly propose a fifth, saying, prema pumartho mahan. Paradise, Vaikuntha, uh, Parmananda is reminding us, is boring, full of this sloth of actlessness. There is nothing to do except staying with God, an endless existence without variation, without effort, and outside of time. The new Vaishnavas are not attracted to that idea. He then describes the superiority of Vrindavana, the philosophically, and philosophically the demonstration is striking. Every successive line shows what is lacking in heaven or by Gunta. First, Nanda and Yashoda are not there. That is, no one to give the unconditional affection of parents, Vatsalya. Second, its greatest lack is, of course, the absence of the gopis, of lovers. But human affection must be many-colored. Life is not fulfilled by the presence of lovers alone. Heaven lacks the presence of the cowherd boys, Krishna's childhood friends, who can offer him friendly companionship. So we, we find the primary feature of Vrindavana is its ability to fill human life with love. No renunciatory lament here about who is your lover and who is your son. Katabakanta kaste putra. There is no advice to seek the subtle, high happiness of the cessation of desires. This is a phrase taken from one of my favorite philosophers, Abhinava Gupta. But he also thinks that uh, the object is Trishnakshaya Sukha, that is the um, Sukha, some way happiness, that you get out of the waning of Trishna, waning of thirst, desire, due to the unfulfillment and unsatisfaction of human effort. But the beauty of this world lies not merely in an exquisite human relationships. Prakriti, nature, is immensely powerful in Vrindavana, in both senses of this term, as women, because women are also called Prakriti, but also as an, an anthropic nature. To the poet, a great fault of paradise of the old kind is the absence of the cattle. But the natural world is not just full of animal life. It also includes sentient vegetation, the Kadamba tree, and insentient nature, which nature bodies forth, through which nature bodies forth itself. Inanimate nature does not have life but it has playfulness. 
That is why we must have, for nature's true fullness, the shade of the Kadamba tree, and most of all, Yamuna's water. The Kadamba tree gives us not just its shade, but a constant periodic reminder of nature's beauty. It reminds us that the world we are being walked through is not just perfunctorily present, but arranged with infinite care, like a painting or a picture. We are walking through a world made by an artist. God has painted this world picture. We must not be indifferent to the picturesqueness of this ever-present world. It is not less beautiful simply because we do not have to make an effort to access it. The Kadamba tree's everyday form itself is beautiful, but it also breaks out into blooms in special season. The task of the bhakta, a devotee of this world, is to seek beauty in every possible form and to feel it as a gift when found. I think there is a vast gulf between the waters of the Ganga and the Yamuna. Ganga water is purifying in a ritual sense. If sprinkled, <coughs> it can restore <coughs> ritual cleanliness to all objects. The water of the Yamuna is not like that, at least in this vision. It has other important functions. To become a part of the Vrindavana picture, the water has to be Nirmala, that is clean in a very special sense, not Amala, that has, it is not water that has not been polluted. Yamuna is the stream of human experience, and the Goswamis themselves had said, not like the Mukti Nadi, that is the liver, river of liberation. Water can cleanse human lives of suffering. Water that can cleanse human lives of suffering is to, to be truly designated Nirmala. It is not the water that has not yet seen dirt. It is a metaphor for the effort by which transformative human imagination can overcome the uncleanliness of everyday experience. It's purifying in this true sense. The two notions of paradise are discordant, for ancient thinkers escape from the necessary imperfection of human existence. Sorry. For ancient thinkers escape from the necessary imperfection of human existence can be found in the second world. Vaishnavas are unattached to that world outside this world. This idea of Vrindavana seeks to use the transformative process of art, not on this stage, but to work on real human lives, turning lives into attempted works of art. In this first, our given world itself. It requires a Vaishnavic rebirth of the imagination, but not crossing the door of death. How is Vrindavana created? By using the general ability to create beauty that exists in all human beings, generalizing that in a new sense. That art, not the art in the theater, but the art of human life, has two, some would say, infinite forms. The Vaishnavas are creating a second world by rummaging through the universe of every bit of beauty and carefully putting them together, also infusing that artistic power into every fine filament of the web of life experiences in which we hang like spiders. But the descent of God does not end there. Our ties with the world are not only inside our minds or our hearts. We are always held in an incessant corporeal involvement with the world. The corporeal world surrounds and binds us from the outside through its materiality. That is why we find a striving to introject beauty into those things which are constantly in touch with us, like the plates on which we eat, the saris we drape around us, the cotton sheet to cover our beds with. The weaver's work, for instance, is utilitarian from one angle, artistic from another. Vaishnava is saying that while enjoying the warm shawl draped around <coughs> us, we should not forget, uh, we, sh we, we should not forget the designs embroidered on the fabric. However degraded the world, we must not forget the addresses where something of beauty can be found. Looking at the world, we discover a true duality. Life is undoubtedly full of evil, but it is also full of the auspicious and the beautiful. So we sh should not hasten towards the door of death. If God wills it, we can return to humanity. The peculiarity of the Goswamis does not end here. In some of their great texts, we come across an intriguing figure, a feature. It would be misleading to call it poetic. But anyone who has read the great texts, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu or the Ujjwala Nilamani, will immediately recognize their, perverse, their pervasive presence, presence. Because in a strange sense, this is the object of much of the actual thinking. After saying that Radha is a young girl, the texts engage in an endless, exhaustive catalog of erotic kinesics. 
just as we need a grammar to extract every single drop of meaning from words, we require this grammar of gestures to observe the leela of love. Renunciants cannot participate in domestic life, but they're also human beings endowed with the aesthetic capacity, and therefore they're entitled as any other to observe the erotic drama of the human world. Here again, the Goswamis are inverting the structure inherited from the Rasa theories. Taking the entire apparatus of aesthetics, they are asking all human beings to turn it into furniture of living, to use them to see the Jagannatya, the human comedy, through the conceptual refinements the Kashmiris have presented to the world. So the Goswamis too have a powerful argument for their observation of the human world, but one that is opposed to the denunciatory impulse at the end of the Kashmiri doctrine. Ordinary objects for the Vaishnavas are laden with meaning, laden with aesthetic meaning. Once I was presented with a bed cover from Odisha by a friend. From the Vaishnava perspective, this bed cover is of immense importance for several reasons. In the very act of making the bed in the morning, there's a gesture of returning the cosmos to order. But my bed cover is an instance of general things, both in the sense of being ordinary and in the sense of its being universal. This mundane everyday act already reveals a desire for the beautiful, or even better, a desire to turn something that was not nice into something that is. You know, that is the function of the water of the Jamuna. What is extraordinary, we may ask, in the making of, of a sheet of cloth? First, to follow Marx, we easily forget the unordinary dex dexterity without which it cannot be spun. I cannot spin a bit cover. Only a highly trained craftsman can do it. Only he can create it, not me. Tagore taught us to see things like this in his alphabet book called Shahajpat, so that I can make the transition from merely watching something to really seeing it. The first thing to see in this more serious attentive form of seeing is the play of colors in the bed cover. It is made of deep solid red background on which the weaver has spun designs of conch shells and tendrils and flowers in light cream. First, we encounter the subtle sense of color regarding what colors match and how much design is exactly right, avoiding the extremely sparse and the extremely dense in his composition. The next step is stranger. We can call it going one step beyond God's own creation. God has presented us with many beautifully shaped objects, but the weaver is not content with those. He has rummaged through the whole of God's things and selected those that particularly appeal to his taste and stitch them together in a new arrangement not found in God's world. It is not easy to try to improve on God's things. God has created the exquisite shape of the conch shell, Shankar, and left it half hidden in the sand on the seashore where we can sti still see half its form. There are flowers in the garden revealing their beauty, partly obscured by leaves and twigs. And there's an ever-changing restlessness in these moving forms, it's hard to decide which to focus on. The weaver's artistic intelligence has picked up the conch shell from the sand and given it fullness, its fullness a perfect shape, plucked the shape of the flower from the tree and given it similar perfection and brought them together in a new place, the cotton sheet that he has woven. There was a potentiality of this latent in nature, but it had to be created through a second process of creation beyond God's own. It mimics and goes beyond his creation. One could say that there's a deep incitement to this creativity in nature itself. Living in nature is not a passive immersion in its nat network of objects. It's the thinking inhabitants always imagining ways of doing more things with it. Marx's fascination, fascinating exploration of the estrangement of labor urges us not to focus on just the negativity of alienation, but in other contexts on the miracle that work is. We can see an urge to create a Vrindavan in the activities that go into the making of this bed cover as well. Even this ordinary article bought at Utkalika, the government emporium for handicraft in Puri, we discover the same logic of finding elements and God's created nature to overcome the shortcomings in human life. Its sheer presence reveals the value of the weaver's work and it shows us a presence of art in his work that we should bow to. To the weaver, it gives a deep sense of self-esteem, which is very different from pride. It is, it's ahankara, 
an intense self of the uh, sense of the self, the act of making myself who I truly am, a realization that in all my good and unsuccessful acts, I'm becoming myself. The act of waking up in the morning is quotidian, just like the act of covering the bed. But when I wave the cover in the air inside my room, even if it is small and stuffy, I'm reminded that there are silent waves in the air. Momentarily, the forms dance in the air like lights on waves. And the assemblage of forms reminds me that the earth waiting for me that day is a place of great assortment of beauty. Parmananda or Tagore have not made a mistake in leaving paradise and coming down to earth. What we negligently view as a stained place of unfulfillment has a hidden Vrindavan waiting to be disclosed. It is not just the image of Krishna inside the temple, but the coverlet too bears a deep affinity to Vrindavan. Once this new paradise, halfway between the conventional heaven and the conventional earth, was presented <coughs> to the thought world of medieval India, I think it forced all other strands of, of religious or even secular thought to take its unprecedented propositions into account and orient their own thinking in relation to its newness. It seems that there are two major differences between their desire for paradise and our own, both created by history. Time creates differences, not merely in words and thoughts, but also in the sense of what is humanly possible. First, for them, the most significant problem of life were all personal, experienced by the human individual. They had a deep desire to overcome shortcomings like disease, aging, death, a life without love. Collective experiences were not generally objects of their reflection, like social humiliation of a whole group or the abject poverty of a whole profession or suffering inflicted by conquest. These are treated like forces of nature. I'm calling such experience collective because it's not that they cannot see the misfortune of being born into lowly caste or living in poverty, but they conceive these as individual misfortunes. Also, I cannot claim that they did not see what we now call social structures. Permitting all Hindu thinking, there's a clear registration of the fact that birth into a particular caste determines an individual's life chances in their totality. They could also clearly view it as a structure in a second sense, in the sense that every part of this architecture depended on the support of every other. But their sociological imagination is either absent or feeble. The collective experience of a social group is not an important object of their reflection. The second difference, I think, is more fundamental. Following 18th century European thought, we have learned to believe that the structure of society, however overpowering at any point of time, is still plastic. Structures do not merely break down periodically, ravaged by wars and crises, but these can be destroyed by forming collective will and reshaped in an entirely new way, the process we approvingly describe as revolution. Our thinking differs generally from the pre-moderns on this question of deliberate social change. This was not within the horizon of possibility of their thinking. It is impossible to imagine modern thought without this idea. A third difference emerges from the second. Due to this, all their thinking about what constitutes a good life, whose life can be called a life well-led, focused entirely on the questions of individual life. In our times, our focus is almost exclusively towards public life. Some forms of modern thinking have moved precisely through this excess towards a kind of Leninist end means kind of cal calculus. Consequently, we know that there's a vast disconnect in Marxist and leftist thought about the connection between these two essential aspects of, the human, of human living, the individual and the collective. That is why there's nothing wrong in seeking instruction from pre-modern thought about the shape of our personal existence and its excellence. Pre-modern thinkers did not use the idea of a revolution at every step, unlike us. Yet what the Vaishnavas are proposing is nothing less than a transformative alteration of religious thinking. They wish to invert the relation between God and his creation. But the measure of the difference in historical time between Vaishnavas and us is not recognized without making a final point of deep contrast. Humility is a central theme of the Vaishnava reflection on human life, but modern political thinking cannot stop at this point. It has to be observed that the line between humility and humiliation, which is associated helplessness, is at times rather thin. It can ennoble the lack of recourse against political author authority as the virtue of humility. 
under conditions of modernity, extreme humility, being lowly, lowlier than the grass and more tolerant than the tree, uh, is not a real resolution of the problem of political power. It's very simple from here to move to Tagore because we have already reached a part of his poetic world. The poet says in a song, at one time he had an invitation to live in the great spaces of heaven, Shorga Shava. It seems that he also had some inhabitants there, but he found that life of perfection listless. I crossed the ocean of time and reached the shore of this earth under earth's sleepless sky. Uh, the lines are, Oi alok matal shorga shabhar mohangon, shithai chilo kon juge mo nimontron, mon laglo na mon laglo natai, kaler shagor pari di elem chole, nidra bihin gogon thale. All the pleasures here are familiar and expected. Here on this green soil, there is always gentle whispering behind water and land. Here the carpet of grass is painted with flowers of all colors. In the forest path, life, light is always embracing darkness. Although in this particular poem, she is not explicitly invoked, we can feel the unexplicated presence of Radha as the sign for humanity. The descent from heaven is not merely the absence of darkness and light on the forest path. That itself is meant for something more. For Tagore too, the great shortcoming of paradise was the absence of Yamuna's waters and of the Kadamba tree. But we also notice an important alteration. For Tagore, the great space of paradise is turning into the sleepless sky in the eyes of a man who is placed now inside an infinite universe, infinite time, infinite space. These are lines, these are words from a line, a Tagore song. A picture compatible with the mighty visions produced by modern science's search. Tagore is bowing to modern science and accepting an infinite, untranscendable nature in exchange for the old vision of paradise. We are already in a time we recognize as modernity. In one sense, this essay itself is an evidence of the nearness of Tagore's vision of the Vaishnavas. Often I do, not, I do not have the words to express or capture the refinement and subtlety of Vaishnava concepts in my own irreligious language. And I have to use his words shamelessly all the time. But the fact that I can do this is proof of an immense amount of that tradition already present inside Tagore. Tagore is a fine interpretation of the Vaishnava tradition. First, it disbelieves the idea that Leela in Vrindavan is merely divine. It belongs only to the gods, that it is a place where he exists only with the devotee. Neither he himself nor his devotee suffers a loss. If we eager listeners catch a few phrases of that music, and that music then makes the earth uh, doubly that we have doubly charming, and if my companion of this earth finds a language for her inexpressible love. Uh, these are uh, sentences from Tagore. That will bring real meaning to that song. Vaishnava poets and theologians are accused of plagiarism. Looking at whose tearful eyes did you conceive of Ratha's tears? From whose lips, whose eyes have you stolen those words? How can you say that she now has no right over these songs? Ordinary men and women come to the banks of this great river of songs and poetry flowing toward the sea and take its waters for themselves and their loved ones into their ordinary homes. In one and a half line, he declares the most important truth of Vaishnava thought. Oh, you learned saint, he is saying to the Vaishnavas, you alone find fault with this. That is, ordinary people taking this in a mundane sense. But you feel anger with no reason. He senses instantly that the Vaishnava thought has two sides. One of the learned saints who insists that Vrindavana Leela is metaphorical and warn readers against a literal meaning, including Chaitanya himself in some, period, some moods. On the other side are ordinary people who first taste it as poetry, but then realize this poetic unreality has the power to turn our real earthly life twice as beautiful uh, and charming. Of course, they want to hear the poems and music, but additionally, they want to create a second world of joy that overrides the first unjoyous world in which they live every day. Vaishnavas want to call humans by a different name, no longer Amritir Putra, that is the son of the eternal, but Anundir Shantan, that is children of joy. The learned saints with their interdiction on one side and the, extraordinary subaltern, the ordinary subaltern people on the other put the central figures, Radha and Krishna couple, in two opposite directions. The Vaishnava God, it seems, was on the side of the people. 
Seen closely, there are interesting differences between Krishna and Radha as the main figures in the Vaishnava story. As the theologians believe, Krishna is God himself. The attribution of anthropomorphic character on him is a bit restrained. The painters of Krishna's figures in literature have to be careful not to diminish his divinity. Radha's character was developed by theologians on one side and by poets on the other. Her figure gradually was filled out by theologians drawing attributes from a South Indian goddess, Sri, and invested, and invested on her to insist on the idea that she is the self of Krishna and therefore she is also God's self. She is conceived as Mohini, the person who charms Krishna, is also charmed by him. Slowly, this quality of being Mohini gets diremptured into two aspects. Normally, we see the Mohini quality as being charming, but she also shows the quality of being charmed because she is the sign of humanity. And she alone has the ability to accept the consequences of all her transgressions of social norms. Theologians extended to her divine qualities. So Radha's responsibility is vastly increased for them. On the one side, she remained the most beautiful sign of erotic feminine, but she now also has to perform the functions of God's concert, consort to maintain the world and to distribute not merely love, but also divine compassion. Sri's image is similar to the Christian Pieta. She is called in one uh, description, Karunagra Vanatamukhi, that is uh, leaning forward in compassion. But the poet's Radha remained the incomparable sign of love. The heart of the common people had followed the poetic Radha, not the theological. Tagore is right, in real history, is the poet Radha, poet's Radha who won a complete victory. Wherever this new religion entered into social life, it led to an explosion of artistic creativity. A line like uh, in Bengali, Chole nil shari ningari ningari, parano shohito mor. She walks ringing her wet blue sari along with my heart. Could, not be, uh, could be seen as Krishna's saying to Radha, or an entirely undivine, unspiritual human lover's saying to his human love. Tagore's word, to his, uh, in Tagore's words, to his, his dharar shungine, that is the companion on this earth. Or the other line, I want to be a water carrier at the pond where my love goes for her birth. Jo saruvare pahu niti niti naha, hama bhari salila hoi tahi maha. That is, when a woman says, some kaku now utters a million trills, a million moons rise in the sky, the five arrows of the god of love have become a million now, and the spring wind wafts gently. Soi kokila ava lakha dako, lakha udaya karu chanda, pacha bana ava lakha bana ho, malaya pavana bahumanda. It can be the utterance of an ordinary woman's longing. I entertain a heretical belief that this language never died. This language still remains our major artistic vocabulary for common human affection. Hindi film songs pick up, pick it up, not from a distant past, but from a repertoire which is still present. In the following centuries, this new religi religious sensibility, seeking a fifth Purushartha, Prema, sweeps everything before it and becomes the dominant sensibility of religious life in some parts of India, allowing the transformation of transfiguration of the mundane, particularly by the ennoblement of love. Its language and its images permeate ordinary religious sensibility. But there is, in my reading, also an internal tussle inside the Vaishnava culture itself between the philosophers and the poets, between its theological reading and its poetic reading. Philosophers and ethical thinkers realize the in immense danger of the story of irresistible transgressive love. Consequently, they constantly warn their readers and Vaishnava disciples that these images of trysts in the forest wading the river in the rainy night are metaphors not to be taken literally. The poets, on their side, ignore the metaphoricity of these narratives and write poetry about the transgressive affection of real human lives, lamenting the sorrow of the girl who wanted to meet her lover at midnight, but Yamuna Bhairi Bhai, that Yamuna turned her enemy. It is the defeat of the philosophy's moral scolds which turns this into a triumph of the popular imagination, which views love as a mixture of longing, sorrow, and the elusive rapture in a repressive social order. When I read Vidyapati, 
or Chandidas's poetry, or hear songs, Tungri's folk songs and the Tagore songs, like Oi Buji Bashi Baje, whose subject can only be an unnamed and undivine Radha. I feel the touch of a deep sensibility that is the celebration of the secular, ordinary, popular, feminine, and subaltern. Repressed human life, but defined by an urge to come out of that repression. Everything radical, everything radi everything radical thought taught me to search for. If we learn to read them, we shall, bear, we shall hear the sigh of the oppressed, and we shall discover that did not leave it just sighing against the suffering. They created a musical, poetic, artistic soul of a soulless world. Thank you. Just Wait, we have a microphone. Yes, and, and everyone should hang around also because we have a reception after as well. Thank you, Shadeep, for a very wide-ranging uh, talk. Uh, but before you dove into the uh, Rasa Sindhu, you know, uh, of uh, Vaishnavism and portion of uh, theology, you made some passing remarks about the Upanishads. Uh, and of course, one sees the, the Upanishads and paradise are really almost stand at opposite poles of, of, of a human conception. So I wonder if you could clarify a little bit about what you're referring to in, in terms of the uh, Upanishads. Yeah. <coughs> That's a very good question. And uh, my apologies for just touching on the Upanishads. I initially thought that I simply wouldn't mention the Upanishads. But they're so interesting from a different point of view. I thought that I should barely mention it. You know, I, I feel, um, I think I read the, I have tried to read the Upanishads, but I think I always read the Upanishads through Tagore. You know, I would use uh, theory th that you can get out of uh, people who have thought about time, you know, like, uh, you know, like Bhartriyari, who would say that, uh, the trace of time never disappears. And I always find that that is true in the trace of time in reading. Uh, I'll give you first an European example and then uh, turn to my reading of Upanishad Shrutegor. That, uh, you know, they would mean by that that if I have read Marx first <clears throat> on something on which there is also a lot of writing by Hegel, right? But I Hegel, I read Hegel later, right? There is a trace of my first reading of Marx into my reading of Hegel. You know, that trace is never wiped out. I think you can make an effort. You know, the human mind is very powerful. So we, when we become conscious of that, we can try to erase, you know, the effect of my prior reading of Marx in my reading of Hegel. But normally we don't do it. In my case, of course, I think it is true that I read the Upanishad uh, through uh, Tagore. When I look at Tagore, uh, I find that there are, uh, I would say that there's only one thing which is very important in the Upanishads from his point of view, uh, which is that the appropriate response to your finding your place in the universe is one of wonder, right? And this is something which is reflected again and again in Tagore's poetry. Uh, he has a very, very well-known song which says, Akash uh, Parashurjotara, etc. That is, in this uh, big, big and beautiful. I think this is the crucial point: big and beautiful. Big meaning intricate, very complex and beautiful. Uh, and my song arises out of that sense of wonder. But I have felt recently thinking more about uh, the question of disenchantment. Because there's been a lot of writing on disenchantment recently. You know, Hans Joas has a book called The Power of the Sacred, which is almost entirely on Weber's writing on disenchantment and his disagreement with that. <clears throat> I have felt that there is a kind of uh, prefiguration of that kind of argument in Tagore. Because what Tagore finds attractive in the Upanishads is this wonder must be bifurcated into two forms of wonder. It's very different. 
One is the wonder at something which is so complex, so infinitely complex. I think the term infinite is important, so infinitely complex. And on the other side, it is also an aesthetic wonder that when I look at it, I still see it as very beautiful, right? But the two senses of wonder elicit from the human side two very different types of responses. You know, one is the cognitive response of science, trying to understand nature more and more, more accurately. And the other one is the aesthetic wonder, that is, the more we see the complexity of nature, we are also struck by the simultaneous aesthetic quality, the beauty of the design. Now, if you look at it that way, I think you can probably develop an argument that Weber's idea that the more science expands, the more difficult it becomes to see the uh, beauty of the world is something we should not take for granted. It has been taken as something taken more or less unchallenged. If you look at the entire discussion over secularism, secularization, etc., this is taken more or less as unchallenged. I don't think it should be taken unchallenged, and that is something that I find in Tagore's reading of the Upanishad. I have used an example very simple um, that uh, I go to the bank of the Hudson at uh, sunset, and I find that you know, the sunset is very beautiful. And I have somebody with me who is a scientist. And uh, the scientist, and I ask him, in fact, why is it like this, right? Now, I'm deliberately using the sentence, why is it like this? Because the sentence is ambiguous between complexity and beauty. Why is it like this can be interpreted in both these ways. And the scientist actually says that this is the reason why the sun looks like this in the evening and in the morning. And so I get an explanation. I'm being unjust to Weber, but I think this is the drift of the argument that I take from Tagore against Weber to some extent. That if Weber is completely right, then next day I should not go to the Hudson because you know the dispelling of the mystery, this, but the dispelling of the cognitive mystery, if we go into the argument more uh, seriously now, should actually dispel the aesthetic beauty of the thing. But it need not. In fact, I might still go to the Hudson next day and feel charmed by, <laughs> by it. And I personally feel that there is, an, there is a prospect of this kind of an argument that you get in the Tagore discussion on the Upanishad. There is a, a fairly long discussion in the book, but uh, yeah. Um, Thank you for this wonderful talk that really takes us from Ovinava Gupta to um, Goshami Zabrindavan to Tagore. Uh, I had a question that was more about a historical formation of the idea of paradise, especially if we bring in the early modern moment, the Brindavan moment. Uh, as we all know, the very foundation of Brindavan happened because of Mughal patronage. Uh, from Choitanya to the Pushti Margs, to the very foundation of the temples, the architecture. So where does Islamic ideas of Jannat fit within this sort of a Hindu theology of paradise, whether from the 10th to the 19th century? And that's also with Kashmir, of course, I'm thinking about the question of paradise. It resonates a lot today. So where, where would you locate the Indo-Islamic within the longer Dury history of Vaikuntha or paradise? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. The only thing is that I would not say early modern with that kind of confidence, because I think I, I would agree, however, that uh, it is a separate period, it seems to me, that the period from the 16th to the 18th century, I think should be treated distinctly from the period that has gone before. But I do not entirely agree that whenever we get a new period, we should actually get a name for it, which is snatched from European history that we call it early modern. Because I don't think every feature of that period actually answers the description of the modern if you take it from, from Europe. But that's a different, different question. You know, your question asks uh, about things which I think we have explored, um, we have not explored very fully. And sometimes it's difficult to give very confident answers. You know, I've personally find influence um, sometimes a difficult concept because influence always 
influence intrinsically, the term influence itself, you know, has a directionality built into it, with X influences Y. I think what I find more, um, you know, appropriate in thinking through this kind of thing is to see that there is a relationship between X and Y, you know, of an exchange. And we need to go more into actual text, uh, do more uh, research into actual locations and things like that. I don't think we have enough historical knowledge to make confident connections of that kind. But I think there's absolutely no doubt that there's a lot of exchange going on you know, between the Islamic and the, and the non-Islamic. And uh, Islamic and the Hindu, if you want to put it that way. Um, for instance, I feel on the one side, in Islamic, Indian Islamic Sufi thought, you know, the idea of uh, your being in love with, with God, or the Nizam, or whatever. My Nizam se naina lagai re. You know, one of the most famous songs of that. Very similar to what you get in the Vaishnavas. Very, very similar to what you get in the Vaishnavas. But I hesitate to say that there's, a, there's an influence from one to the other, simply because influence demands something, you know, which is more rigorous, established connection, which I do not have. You know, so that's why I would like not to notice that connection. I would like not to miss that connection. At the same time, I wouldn't say that it's, a, uh, it's one of influence in that sense. But this is the kind of thing that I think we should explore more. I try to keep on this, uh, this side of the Vaishnavas because, you know, first of all, I'm not a scholar of religion. I'm not a Sanskritist. But I can read some of these texts, and I take interest in a few of them. I try to understand them closely, the way I try to understand European texts of political theory. So I always make it a point to say that this is a very limited field in which I can speak with confidence. <coughs> Wonderful uh, lecture, Professor Kaviraj. Uh, my question is around uh, Buddhism and its view on paradise. We, Buddhism, most of it views it as very ephemeral, transient, life is dukkha as a premise. In that context, uh, how would you view Buddhist influence on Hindu thought and the view on paradise? Uh, say that again, I couldn't catch the first part of what you said. Buddhism fundamentally hmm. starts with the notion that life is dukkha, is unhappiness, and that even <coughs> the quest for pleasure and paradise is a fool's errand, and if at best it's ephemeral and transient. In that context, how would you view our quest for paradise? That is again a very important question because Implicitly, what I'm saying is, um, based on my very uneven knowledge, uh, I know a little bit about the Vaishnavas, I know a little bit about the Kashmiri Shaivas, but I've read their aesthetic texts. Abhinava Gupta, for instance, is a great tantric philosopher, and I'm not very well versed on the tantric side of uh, Abhinava. And some of my friends uh, tell me that if you do not understand the tantric side of Abhinava, you do not understand the aesthetic side. So maybe that my understanding of the aesthetic side is also inadequate. But I, I see a very important difference in the Vaishnavas. Let me put it very sharply, because probably in my book, uh, I put it extensively with more examples. And I also claim it very sharply at the start at the end. But here, I couldn't present the argument of the whole chapter. But the basic point is that you know there's some types of arguments in Indian religious thought which say something which I find profoundly powerful, but also profoundly disturbing. And I find this somewhat similar between Advaita philosophers among the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Buddha particularly, and um, yeah, and um, most others including Abhinav Gupta. You know, because Abhinav Gupta ultimately says that the sukha that you should try to aim at is the sukha of vairagya, right? Vairagya actually means that you non-attachment, but of a highly sophisticated and complex type, 
And in one place, when he, is, he feels pressed, that he must actually give you an example of what he means by that. He uses that phrase to explain that, that the sukha is a trishna kshaya sukha. Right? But the basic argument, I think, is very powerful. The basic argument is that in human life, you have a lot of suffering. And one of the major causes of suffering is that you cannot control circumstances. So somebody who is very close to you dies. Or somebody who is very close to you goes away, you know, forever. Or somebody very close to you changes and therefore doesn't care for you anymore. That causes dukkha, right? And what can root out the dukkha more, which I think logically infallible, that you are initially, from the first, you are not attached to them. <laughs> so practice non-attachment, right? So I think it's an argument which is logically infallible, but otherwise unconvincing. Because, and I think this is what I, I suppose the Vaishnavas are essentially saying and trying to articulate in a more philosophical sense. That, you know, that might actually create a situation where you would not be, uh, you would not suffer, but you would have a human life which is not worth having. Because the whole point of human, li human life is affection. But I think they do not have a naive understanding of affection. They realize that you know, affection is assailed by problems all the time. You know, affection is rare, affection is uh, sometimes transient, and affection is actually subject to all these dif difficulties. But in spite of that, you know, the argument in the two cases go in two different directions. In one case, the argument is that because the affection is all that, you know, try to practice non-affection, you know, non-attachment. And these people are trying to say that if you do that, then human life would not be worth living. So turn to this, and then try to find ways in which you can expand that, you can hold on to that. And I think there's a lot of very, very beautiful, but I think also philosophically poignant discussion about uh, this in the Vaishnavas, sometimes in Abhinava also, although Abhinava does not take this philosophical position, and Tagore, about memory. That, you know, memory is a weapon by which you can actually overcome a whole lot of this. So you might lose somebody, but the loss of that person is not necessarily the loss of the memory of that person. And memory is something by which you can take revenge on death, or you can actually overcome death or something like that. So I think the, what they're trying to say is something that goes right against you know, that tradition of thinking, uh, tradition of detachment. I find that argument in the Gita uh, I find that argument in the Buddhists. Uh, it's, of course, very strongly present in, uh, in Advaita. I also find it present in Abhinava, who is a, one of my greatest, uh, you know, uh, most admired philosophers. But ultimately, when he comes to that, uh, I think I prefer the Vaishnava view to his view. <laughs> Last question. Yes. This one is the last one. Yes. Thank you, Professor Kaviraj. That was a wonderful, obviously, talk. And uh, I really am affected by your uh, attempt to reconcile different, two alternate or two co seemingly contradicting, you know, uh, visions of what paradise could be. Uh, but my question is this, much of, uh, you know, you began with this dichotomy, so to speak, of kind of religious, uh, spiritual paradises, more of, more of religious and ethereal paradises and, Paradises as posited by radical social ideologies, but one reason, one one uh, much of social uh, I social ra radical social ideologies stem from the perceiving of the present and present circumstances as not just unbearable but exceptional in terms of their oppression through their uh, in the in, in in evil and in misery, which to why such a degree that they are almost. Why do, you, why do you call them exceptional? Uh, I mean, I, I I mean to say that. The, much of the language of uh, radical ideology is presupposes that there is something ungeneralizable about those circumstances, in which case, do they naturally not forestall any attempt of sadharani karana? Say that again, the last part. Uh, so I mean, if let us say we are, we are today seeing a period of great social movements, and the almost the linchpin of these movements is that there is something that's exceptional that is happening in the moment, in the present moment, 
something that, that most of us, or no human beings perhaps even experienced, almost making them ungeneralizable. If they're ungeneralizable, how can an aesthetic theory that is, that is uh, premised upon sadhara nikarana, the commonization or generalization, or standardization of experience, human experience, uh, be applicable? So does not, does, do, 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 doesn't a present circumstance then forestall an attempt at sadhara nikarana? Uh, I can only uh, I can only repeat what I have said because I think what is very interesting about Abhinava is that Sadharani Karana for him is not every single person having the same experience. You know that is not what he's saying. He's saying that there is some a common object, you know, common concept or common object about which everybody is responding, but everybody is responding in a way which is unique to himself. So it is not actually everybody feeling the same feeling. You know, everybody is feeling a different feeling. So that is why I find his idea of generalization, Sadharani Karana, so attractive. Because if you think of somebody who thinks about Sadharani Karana in the European aesthetic tradition, like Gadama, there's a long discussion about uh, what is universalization of experience in art, in truth and method. I think Gadamer goes in the direction of thinking that you know it's the, it's a common experience in the sense of being the experience. It's the same experience in everyone, and what Abhinava does is, you know, he finds a way in which the experience remains common in one sense, but it is also at the same time highly individuated. You know, I can only respond to your uh, question that way about uh, you know generalization and generalizing. 